the time to start, but uh, maybe some people will, will join us uh, in the meantime. But I, so it's a real pleasure to welcome Jan uh, for this uh, fourth and last invited speaker of Gandalf. So Jan uh, has a PhD from Berno and from the Technic, uh, Technical University of Munich. Uh, after that, he was a postdoc uh, in IST Austria, uh, working with uh, Krishnendu Chatterjee and Tom Enzinger. And so Jan is, is, is now uh, quite well known for uh, works both on automata uh, theory. So he's, for example, uh, author of several papers on how to, to do uh, efficient translation from LTL to, to uh, uh, automata over infinite words. So, so a subject that, that, that has been, uh, uh, I mean, uh, important for this edition of Gandalf for several papers. But he has also a nice uh, line of works on MDPs and stochastic games. And uh, on MDPs, for example, he has uh, several works where he shows how to uh, combine uh, algorithm and 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 uh, result coming from formal methods and and algorithm and result coming uh, from uh, learning where uh, techniques are are quite different and the uh, uh, insurances are, are quite different and so today we'll uh, speak about stochastic games so there was also a contributed paper uh, by Jan and, and his team uh, in the previous session and here it will be about uh, so uh, the value iteration algorithm with guarantees for stochastic games. So please, Jan. Thank you very much for the kind words and for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, although here doesn't really mean uh, at Gondor, but uh, back, back at Munich. Um, and uh, let me start with uh, saying that I'm actually uh, very happy that, that uh, these talks, these invite talks happen live. So uh, that allows us to discuss and, and ask questions. So that also uh, I took the liberty of not putting too much notation there. So whenever anything is unclear, just let me know immediately. Just uh, shout it. We are in a seminar room. Just interrupt me, and I think that's uh, that's actually the advantage of uh, the, one of the main advantages of live talks. So uh, let's just take the opportunity of that. So I tried to squeeze the the actual content of the talk on the very first slide. Uh, I'm going to speak about. Uh, stochastic games with uh, multiple reachability objectives. And as Jean-Francois already mentioned, uh, we're going to approximate the values using uh, value iteration. So uh, this is a work that uh, we started with uh, my students Pranav and, and Maxi some two years ago, and then uh, later also Krish and, and, and Tobias joined. And um, uh, we, had a, we had a great time uh, looking at these things because we were actually taking quite a nice uh, open question that uh, I mean, remained open. So uh, if that sounds interesting, then, uh, uh, then uh, let's, uh, let's go on. Uh, I will first tell you a bit more about uh, the model and the objective and uh, our contribution in a nutshell. And then uh, uh, in the second part, I will go more into the details. And in the third, very short part at the end, I would also like to uh, make an announcement about a tool that might be of use for many of you. All right, so uh, let me start. So uh, the model is, uh, Actually, a well-known model, very simple model, uh, and, and namely that of uh, simple stochastic games. So we have uh, vertices of uh, of minimizer and of maximizer, denoted by circle and square, respectively. And we also have stochastic vertices. Uh, so when I don't really write uh, any numbers uh, on the edges here, it's uh, just because I want the picture to be a bit uh, clear and not obstructed by uh, too many numbers. Typically, the numbers aren't important and just think about uh, one half, one half. And you can also see that there is some labeling here and these are actually denoting the target sets. So each state can be labeled by one or more or no labels uh, from, the, from the target set. So it, uh, in this case, we have uh, a state where we have uh, labeled T1 and T2, meaning that this state belongs to the target set T1 and to the target set T2, whereas uh, the one above only belongs to T2 and not to T1. Uh, in this picture, these are sinks, but they don't necessarily have to be. 
All right, so this is the classical model of simple stochastic games. The only difference being that we not only have uh, target sets of one type, but of several types, and they can even overlap. Now, very natural is uh, that of reachability. So like in simple stochastic games with a standard reachability objective, uh, we do actually the very same thing here. We're interested in uh, reachability, but now since we have more types of, uh, or more uh, reachable sets, then we are interested in multiple reachability or generalized reachability, as you may call it. And one way to, um, formalize this is through the notion of uh, achievable vectors. So this is one of the few technical uh, technical definitions that I have in the in the slides, but as you can see it's, uh, it's very simple. So we say that um, pair of numbers uh, which are between 0 and 1, say 0 0.6 and 0 0.3, uh, is achievable if there exists a strategy of a maximizer such that no matter what the opponent does, no matter what the minimizer does, the probability to reach the first target set is at least T1, so say 0 0.6, and the probability to reach the second target set is at least T2, so 0 0.3 in our example. All right, so uh, I hope that uh, this, uh, this is clear and, and intuitive. And now this allows you to think of the set of all achievable vectors. So, uh, and in principle, it uh, may, the, the vectors that you may be interested in may depend on the preferences that you have on the targets. Maybe, T1 is so important for you that uh, it's your primary goal and you do everything to, you can do to reach T1 and only if you have two options that uh, are equivalent, then maybe you take the one that is better for T2. So in that case, uh, it might be that uh, you can reach, uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can have a point one zero that is achievable. So you can reach T1 almost surely, so with probability one. Uh, but at the expense of not getting to T2 at all. It might also be that your preferences are the other way around. So in this case, uh, if you prefer T2 over T1, then you may get 0 0.7 chance of getting to T2, at uh, the expense of not getting to T1 at all. And of course, uh, there can be a trade-off. So you can, of course, mix your decisions. So then uh, uh, the set of all uh, achievable points is actually convex. And uh, if you look at the set of all achievable points, it may look like, like this, then you can also consider the so-called Pareto frontier, which is giving a bit more compact description of what the achievable points are. Namely, it gives you the, um, the boundary of this area. So in that sense, uh, these are maximal points uh, when they are uh, pairwise uh, incomparable then uh, they both lie on the Pareto frontier. So these are the points that you can achieve and at the same time in a particular direction one could say you cannot achieve better. So for instance the point that is over here is the best one that you can achieve in this direction. So maybe uh, if we have a look at uh, uh, an example where we have uh, here 45 degrees, it just expresses your preferences between T1 and T2 are, uh, are equal. So you don't prefer more one than the other. And then you're interested in how much you can achieve uh, in, uh, in for, for this particular ratio of preferences. All right, so the parity frontier is somewhat a bit more compact description of uh, this whole this whole area and our goal in this talk will be to actually construct such a frontier and to speak in terms of uh, complexity a bit more simply then we can also think of the decision problem that is underlying this construction of the party frontier which is given a vector t 
is that vector achievable? Okay, so this is a decision problem, and then we also have uh, we also have this this construction problem that that we're going to solve. All right, so this is our problem. One why is it interesting and uh, why is it maybe more complicated that you might, than you might expect? Well, the reason is that um, also the strategies that you may use for this problem may need to be more complicated than uh, in some other settings that uh, you may know. So there are two strictly simpler settings than this one. One that uh, restricts the number of objectives to one, so you only have one target set, that's this case, and then the other restriction is that you only have one player, so you have a mark of decision process, so that means one player and stochasticity, but you can have more target sets. So in the former case, uh, it is well known that uh, you can do with memorialized deterministic strategies, and that makes things, of course, uh, reasonably simple. Uh, of course, then uh, it's still uh, maybe a practical problem how to compute things efficiently, uh, but complexity-wise, uh, things are not terrible and uh, they're obviously uh, immediately decidable and everything is, is uh, nice and clear. Now, for MDPs, uh, this is uh, getting slightly worse in the sense that uh, we need uh, randomization even in simpler settings and in general settings of, on observance, uh, we may even need to use memory. Uh, we can do with finite memory, as is actually shown in uh, one of the papers by uh, Benjamin Francois. Um, but uh, in our case, uh, it has been already shown that even in the simpler case, when all the target states are absorbing, even then you may need to use infinite memory. So this already hints at uh, some uh, devil hi hidden behind this problem and that uh, may point uh, or may suggest that also the computational complexity might be higher. And indeed, uh, for... Um, simple stochastic games, uh, we of course can guess the strategy and then the counter strategy, so we have the well-known uh, inclusion in, in NP. For the case of mark decision processes, so one player games, uh, it moves, the multi-objective uh, setting moves it from polynomial, uh, polynomial time to polynomial space, um, which is, uh, well, I mean, of course, uh, not uh, too fortunate, but uh, still something that we can uh, reasonably work with. But interestingly, and that's maybe also uh, uh, due to the uh, infinite memory that is required here, the decidability of our problem is still left open. And uh, I'm not going to answer it. So if you're actually interested in this problem, go ahead. Uh, this is... Uh, one of the kind of napkin problems that you can uh, very easily explain on a, on a, on a small napkin uh, within three minutes, um, but, the, but the decidability is still left open for, uh, for quite some time, although people have been trying. And actually the, the most uh, uh, successful result, uh, no one could say, is the paper by uh, Roman Brangier and, and Vuita Foreta, uh, who are actually now uh, or both in, uh, in industry, uh, who have proven that the problem is uh, decidable actually for the case of two objectives and stopping games. So the special case of stopping games and the special case of only two objectives. So, uh, and, and that was based on uh, some uh, quite complex analysis of um, the, the, the derivatives uh, there and uh, I mean, the techniques uh, were not easy to, to, to generalize and moreover, they were really bound to, uh, to stopping gains. So uh, the question is, is uh, pretty wide open. So instead, what we're going to do, uh, if we cannot answer that question, we are going to approximate uh, the Pareto frontier, which of course also leads to uh, something that is often called delta decidability. So uh, we can decide the problem uh, up, up to the delta. So we can uh, approximate arbitrarily in, uh, uh, in any direction. So given a point, we can answer the question whether uh, it is achievable if, uh, uh, up to the delta movement of that point, uh, which might be practically uh, interesting already, although we have no idea whether the problem is decidable. 
So um, I Jan, I have a question. So yes, go ahead. Is, so is this uh, related? So is this uh, gap problems that you are uh, referring to? Or so you you are you say okay if the probability is say uh, above it's, one uh, above c plus epsilon or below c minus epsilon, I will be able to to decide the problem, or is it different? Uh, yes. So I mean, we can. Yes, indeed. I mean, if if you have if you have uh, some error tolerance, then you can approximate to less than this error tolerance, and then uh, this gives you the answer to the to the question. Indeed. Okay. Yeah, it's maybe a bit uh, stronger what you can say here than the only answer the gap problem, but it at least covers the gap problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. So uh, yeah, so it's 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 certainly not an answer to uh, to the question that uh, I want to answer, but uh, it's the first step uh, on the on the way to decidability. Or well, maybe not really the first step because uh, there is also already the result on for two dimensions. But uh, uh, it might be uh, might be an interesting step uh, towards it. All right. So uh, the question is, how do one how how one can how one can do such a thing? And uh, this is not really novel. I mean, this has been uh, on the market for uh, already quite a few years. You can simply uh, approximate by so-called value iteration that I will recall later. But the idea is that uh, you start with knowing that uh, you can certainly cover or you can certainly achieve uh, zero, zero, and then gradually you propagate information about the system and you get better and better approximations until until when? Uh, at some point you have to stop and then uh, what people typically do and what most of model checkers have been doing also in the single dimensional case, they stop at a point of time when the numbers don't change much anymore. Uh, but that of course doesn't give you any guarantee. Uh, therefore, we have to do something, uh, something more, and we are actually going to do the same trick that uh, has been done for uh, the single dimensional case and also for, for MDPs quite a few years ago, as I will explain. And namely, we are going to look at also an over approximation. And if you can also uh, run an over approximation, then uh, at every point of time, you know how far these two approximations are, and then you know how precise your current estimate is. So that is, uh, that is uh, what we wanna do. Now, why is this uh, actually uh, difficult? Uh, why is this not, uh, um, actually trivially following from the standard value iteration algorithms. Uh, the point is that this over approximation is sort of fixed point computation that may not need to converge to the real black thing here, to the, to the real value, because there may be more fixed points. And this is a problem that has appeared in uh, various settings already, and we have learned from that, and uh, we, offer this, uh, we offer a solution that is based on uh, several uh, very simple ideas. The first idea is to actually look at the multi-objective problem as a collection of single objective problems, where each problem is defined by the direction in which we are interested in going. And then there is a continuum of these problems. And this view is not novel. Uh, this is actually very much classics in optimization. Uh, in the verification community, this has been uh, presented very nicely in, uh, in this paper. And uh, it effectively allows you to attack multi-objective problems, basically no matter what they are, using single dimensional techniques for particular direction, for particular preferences uh, of, of objectives. Now, when you have such problem, then you can actually apply a, demand, a single dimensional solution for that one, and you're done except that uh, there are uncountably many of these problems, right? So uh, there are uncountably many directions. So what you need to do is you need some sort of geometric uh, uh, argument why you can partition uh, these directions into only finitely many classes, uh, something like regions, uh, and, it will, and they will actually very much look like regions from time automata as we shall see. All right, so I think this is, uh, 
in a nutshell, uh, on, the, on the high level, what we're going to uh, have a look at in detail in the second part are the questions. All right, so. Um, Can I ask a very trivial yeah, question? Um, um, so this Pareto frontier, is it some differentiable curve? It, it has kinks, right, in, typically? So the Pareto frontier, uh, that's a, the, thank you for the question, is a very interesting object. The only thing that we know is that actually this area is convex. Uh, the Pareto frontier might be consisting of finitely many uh, line segments. It might not. We don't know. Uh, for this problem, we don't know. For many classical problems, this uh, the, it's the case that it only has finitely many um, uh, points where um, you kind of change, right? And then uh, it's only line segments. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, piecewise, it's piecewise linear, exactly. Uh, it could be uh, that you have, uh, you have countably many of these points. It could be mm -hmm. that you even have a curve, right? I mean, it could even be a circle. We don't know. There has been no examples uh, observed yet for this, uh, in this context, uh, but there is no indication of a proof uh, that there is none. So mm -hmm. it, in principle, it might even be that case. And besides that, the fact that we have the, a point on a curve doesn't necessarily mean that that point itself is actually achievable. It might even be that in this direction, uh, you can achieve any point on this, on this line, but the final one. So the Pareto curve is actually rather the, uh, the boundary of all the set of all achievable points rather than uh, necessarily the, the maximum ones. So uh, it might be even that bad. Uh, who knows, right? Uh, so there are there are there are settings where um, these 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 uh, uh, issues may happen. We hope that this wouldn't be the case. And actually, the proof in the paper by Forrest and Brangen, uh, 2016, is exactly along the lines of proving that there are only finitely many line segments. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's it's very much tailored to that to that setting. I see. Thank you very much. So uh, it doesn't really. F I mean, no, nothing nothing carries over to the more general one. Thanks for the question. So Other yeah, more questions? I have a follow up question. So um, so do you know? So if I fix uh, say a CD a threshold, uh, um, I fix a threshold. So do we know if for ex the second player has a memory less strategy? Uh, uh, an optimal memory less strategy to to avoid you to to succeed on that. Um, let me see. So if you fix a, a threshold, whether the minimizer has a spoiling strategy that is memory less, um, I I don't think that this is necessarily the case in this setting. Uh, it may differ, what we are considering here is the so-called lower value actually. So this thing that we have seen here, uh, sorry for going up, uh, is actually corresponding to the uh, sup-inf problem. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're interested <clears throat> in, uh, in, in, in maximizing and Solving it so that the, the, uh, the maximizer player can guarantee. If you instead consider the the upper value, so what is it that uh, the minimizer can guarantee? So it's like uh, what? Uh, how much can minimizer definitely spoil it uh, to the to the maximizer? Then this value is uh, possibly higher uh, because these games are not determined. And in that case, uh, then one of the players has, I think, a uh, memorial spoiling strategy, but this, this, these are not actually published results. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this is, there, is no, there is no proof of this as far as I'm aware of. So be, be, with, um, uh, so with Branguier, we, we, we studied the Pareto curve for mean pair, multi dimensional mean pair of games. And there we exploit this mm -hmm. to show that it's, uh, you, I mean, it's, it's, uh, 
it's um, yeah, convex, uh, not only convex, but also a polyhedra, in fact, the, 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 mm -hmm. the and, and, but so this is based on, on, on taking basically uh, into account all the possible memoryless strategies of, of the, the second player. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let, let me just say that the mean payoff is, uh, is indeed simpler. Uh, I mean, multi dimensional mean payoff is, uh, is, is simpler. And uh, it might be that in the in the upper value case, uh, actually, some of the I mean, the strategy complexity might also be uh, simpler than than in this uh, this lower value case. Of course, this one is a bit more interesting. I mean, if we are after maximizing, this one is a bit more interesting because that's what we can guarantee. So uh, it's it's more like verification, uh, and more interesting for verification. This one this one is certainly also interesting. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. So uh, thanks for the questions, and then uh, I think we can dive into the actual uh, technical details. So this is the this is the second uh, out of like three slides, which uh, contains some um, uh, some notation and then some formalism. Uh, and this is uh, to re uh, recall what value iteration is. So let me first uh, recall that in the case of a uh, single dimensional uh, objective. So uh, value iteration is a way how to compute a uh, value, say in a, in a simple stochastic game, uh, by first assigning uh, the value to the target. So let's say we're interested in T1, right? Single objective, so T1. So we know that when we are here, here, then the value is one because we're already in the target. Similarly here, and we also know that in this sink, the value is zero because we can't reach T1 at all. And now value iteration uh, does the following. Uh, it applies repetitively updates for the states of the game and propagates the value. So what it does in probabilistic uh, vertices is it takes the weighted sum over successor over values of successors weighted by the transition probabilities so say if this is uh, half half then what you do is you can propagate the value of one half times zero plus one half times one leading to the value of one half here uh, similarly here you have a weighted sum of ones uh, giving you one for Maximizer states, uh, it takes the maximum value of all uh, successors. Well, here we only have one, which uh, results in one half here and one there. And for minimizer vertices, it takes the, the minimum value, okay? Because that's what minimizer wants to achieve. So uh, minimizer would go over here. So the value is taken to be one half. And you see that in these acyclic games, you immediately get, um, you immediately get uh, the value uh, in all the states correctly. All right, now in multidimensional case, what you're propagating is not just values, but you have to propagate the sets of achievable vectors, which are, however, uh, at every moment of the approximation process, they are finite convex sets. So finite in the sense that there is a finite description using uh, using the line segments. Like here, for instance, uh, when we uh, consider this vertex, then uh, or maybe let me let me first draw uh, here that uh, our point is, is uh, one one. Here, what we're getting is uh, zero one. And then uh, if you actually take uh, the sort of average of those, uh, weighted average of those, then what you're getting is that you can get any point below half one, all right? Uh, because if you go here, then with one half, you get to T1, and with certainty, you get to T2. So that point is, uh, is achievable and everything below it as well. Similarly, you, we have it on the other side. So uh, that works nicely for the probabilistic vertices. Uh, here, the maximizer doesn't really uh, have the choice, so we cannot really demonstrate this. I will do that in a second. And the minimizer wants to take the minimum. What is the minimum of two uh, planar objects? Well, it's their intersection, uh, and that actually works. If it was a maximizer's vertex here, then we would take the union, 
which would result in an object like this. But of course, we're closed under mixing, so we can make it convex. So then we are ending up with this shape. So that is what uh, value iteration does uh, in the multi-dimensional setting, uh, which is, I mean, has been proven correct in 2013. And uh, it's all great. Um, and in the acyclic case, it gives, you, uh, it gives you the correct values. Now, the problem are the cycles. So let's first look at the very simple uh, type of uh, cycle, and that is a probabilistic cycle. So in this case, uh, you see that uh, the approximation, what you get, uh, what you can get here is dependent on what you can get here, here, and recursively on the own value. So at first, you know that you can get to T2 with some probability, maybe just say uh, one quarter and one quarter or something, and uh, with uh, to T1 only with, uh, with one quarter, so you get this small this small area, but then this propagates the value over here. And now next time in the next iteration, you take the weighted average of these values plus now also this one. This makes it a bit bigger and a bit bigger and a bit bigger. Uh, but you see that uh, since it's recursively dependent, then unless you solve uh, this recursive equation, but you just numerically approximate, you're not getting the precise value, only in the limit. And the same actually happens if you start over approximating. So if you start with assuming I can't get more than uh, I can't get more than uh, than one one, then if you gradually improve your approximation, then you monotonically uh, go towards uh, the actual uh, actual half one, which is this point, uh, but you will only reach it in the limit. So this is, uh, this is standard uh, and this is known for a long time. It's also known that if you do it for a long enough time, then in the end, essentially it's enough to round the values to a certain, uh, to a certain uh, number with, uh, dependent on the common uh, uh, denominator of all the things that, that appear in the game and you will get the precise value as well. Although it may, this may take some time. Uh, the real problem, the core problem, why we have more fixed points of the over approximation are the end components. And this is a problem that appears as soon as with MDPs with a single reachability objective, as has been observed already a couple of years ago, as I will uh, say in a second. So what is the problem here? Imagine that we have these two states here, and uh, we know that, of course, we can't get more than uh, value one. And then uh, they can go back and forth. And this one also can actually go elsewhere where we know that the value is 0 0.5. Let's assume that, all right? Now observe that, of course, if you uh, keep on running around, you're not getting one, you're not reaching any target at all, and you're, you're ending up with zero. So this one is not really a true value. I mean, this is kind of promise of uh, this guy to that guy, which is based on promise of, uh, of, the, of the original guy. So it's a circular dependency of lies. And this uh, circle of lies has to be broken. And um, this is what, uh, what the solution for end components in the MDPs is based on. You first have to identify these end components. So these are strongly connected sets that are closed under probability. So that means uh, there is no probabilistic branching out uh, from the from the uh, from the set, and uh, this that means that we can actually stay in this set uh, forever. Now the solution is then based on collapsing this end component into a single state. Uh, that has no self loops uh, coming from the inner dependencies or interdependent uh, interdependencies, and it only has the outgoing edges. In that case, obviously, you immediately update the value of this macro state to zero point five, and you're actually done. Okay, so it's like that the as if the, the it was artificially inflated or bloated somehow. The, there was a higher pressure than uh, everywhere around, and then you sort of release the tap, and so you, you kind of uh, 
uh, equalize the pressure in and out, um, which will be a possibly useful um, useful picture uh, uh, later in the, uh, the multiplicative uh, case. All right, so this was suggested already uh, already six years uh, ago, and uh, has been further generalized to the case of stochastic games, where the situation is more interesting. Uh, because on the one hand, you can define end components, which would possibly be this whole thing. But now, and that's, uh, uh, that's uh, an interesting thing about uh, the end components in the stochastic games, uh, the that states of a single end component do not necessarily have to have the same value. In the MDP case, they have the same value, so we can collapse them. In stochastic games, is not the case. For instance, here, if we know that we can get 0 0.7 here and 0 0.5 here, then certainly you can get 0 0.5 here, uh, but over here, the minimizer will not let you get it, and it will send you over here, over and over, until you decide that you leave and you will only get 0 0.5. So, uh, the values may be different, and if you start with assuming that it's not more than one, then this is actually, again, a circular dependency of the, of the values that uh, is consistent and hence a fixed point. So the maximizer will go here because uh, one is promised over here, similarly over there. No matter what the minimizer does, uh, it's getting back to one. So everyone believes that uh, we're, everyone is getting one, uh, but it is not the case. If we keep on doing this, then we never get anything. So uh, we already know that it can't be more than 0 0.7, like in the MDP case. Uh, but we also have uh, seen that it can't be down here more than 0 0.5 and uh, actually also here. Why is that? Because this actually is something that we call a simple end component, which is an end component where all the states have the same value. In this case, 0 0.5. There is also an alternative phrasing and that is, it is an end component if we fix a minimizers, uh, an optimal minimizer strategy. Uh, so if minimizer behaves optimally, then this edge is not there and the whole thing is not an end component. Only this part is an end component and indeed they share the same value, 0 0.5. And once you realize that, uh, then you can again deflate it, you can uh, release the, uh, the uh, su superficial, uh, 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 sorry, the, the, the extra the extra pressure that is that is uh, in, in in the end component and equalize it with the with the actual value. All right, so that is uh, the basic, uh, well, or at least the basis of the of the solution of, from this paper. Uh, the basic idea. Uh, there are, of course, some more technical details, but uh, this is as far as we, as we want to go. And uh, now, of course, when we ask, okay, what if, uh, what if uh, then the value is actually different because we are only approximating these values. So maybe this changes later on, then uh, actually something else is in a simple component. So depending on the values, you may have different uh, simple end components. And this is actually a dynamic notion. It may change then as you change the approximation and the set of your simple end components may change. Of course, it is in the end constant of if you have the true values, uh, but you don't know them up front. And in the multi-objective case, it is very similar, just one step more complicated. Uh, namely, um, in this case, if you have, uh, say, this Pareto curve and here this Pareto curve, then if you're interested in the T1 axis, then uh, minimizer will go down here because there it's only this that can be achieved, one half, not one. And this is a simple end component. If, on the other hand, you're interested in T2 axis, so you prefer T2, then minimizer is fighting that with going up and uh, there ensuring half only instead of one, okay? So not only that the end components can, uh, can, can evolve over time, 
but at the same time, you have different components depending on which preference of target sets you have. So in principle, you can have different uh, directions of preference uh, inducing different simple end components. And then again, we talked about that there are uncountably many directions. So what do we do about that? Well, actually, you uh, may see that the end components there really depend only on the decision of the minimizer. So we only need to detect when under certain and under which circumstances the minimizer changes the decision. So if we're interested more in T1, it goes down. If we are interested more in T2, it goes up. Okay, and the boundary is exactly these 45 degrees. And uh, as a consequence, if you look at the lower part where we're interested more in T1, then you see that this thing is propagated over here and over here, and they have the same value with respect to these directions, the directions below the 45 degree. Uh, and the guy above can achieve more. If on the other hand, you're interested more in T2, then this value is propagated to this simple end component and this guy gets more. And this is a general pattern that uh, uh, you, have, you decompose, uh, you find these dashed lines that decompose the area and each can be then solved separately. How do you get this dashed line? What was the moment when minimizer changes the decision? Well, that was the moment when uh, the Pareto curves cross. So you look at the intersection and that was the decisive moment that then partitions the set of directions into those below and above 45 degree. And if you look at the projective hyperplane that goes here, uh, then you see that uh, we decompose the, the, rather than speaking about the directions, we can speak about the region on the projective hyperplane, which is this one and another one over here. So we decompose that into two regions that we're interested in and each is solved separately. So this is the key idea and actually the, uh, the only major idea. Now it has to be generalized into a multi-dimensional case, so not only two dimensions, but how does it look in, in 3D. So uh, that is not that difficult. Uh, let me just show you a few pictures to give you a flavor of this. So in this case, uh, you can achieve each of the target sets uh, exclusively, I mean with probability one, but exclusively, and then you can of course mix. Uh, so maybe that's uh, one thing that you can achieve. Maybe then you have another action that achieves uh, 0 0.7 in all uh, dimensions. And then uh, these are your two choices. So now these are the two Pareto frontiers. And you see that if you look at the, I mean, now you look at the intersections and all that, then it becomes a bit more complicated. But if you stick to the projective hyperplane, and what you're getting is a picture like this. So this is the projective hyperplane uh, bounded to the probability values. And you see that it is nicely decomposed into here four regions, actually. Uh, one, of the, one of them is consisting of three parts, and then you can chop it into three, three pieces if you, if you want to be convex. And the same holds uh, for, uh, for more complicated cases. Sometimes you get uh, non-convex areas and then you have to chop it into pieces uh, so that you can easily work with that. And uh, so you can chop it into so-called uh, simplices, uh, which are actually very similar as regions in timed automata. So it's like uh, inner parts of the triangles and uh, these are separate regions and these are separate regions, et cetera, et cetera, which is also very useful if you have cases where you have lower dimensional uh, Pareto frontiers in high dimensional space. Right, then you get funny intersections such as this one. So you only intersect in a, in a point and then you still have to work with that. So one region is this open area uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and then another region is here, another region is here and, uh, and, and so on. Okay, so this, this is some, there is a bit of geometry behind that, but uh, it's, it's not that difficult. All right, so uh, to sum it up, um, 
uh, this is the new value iteration algorithm that is based, of course, on the old one. And then we see that uh, the initialization works exactly the same as before. So we start with lower bound being zero everywhere. So we know that we and can achieve at least zero everywhere and we cannot achieve more than one anywhere. And we also initialize the targets depending on to which targets as they belong. And then we do the standard uh, Bellman update. So that was the that was the equations that I described the value iteration with. So what do you do for maximizer? What do you do for minimizer states? What do you do for probabilistic states? And you do that as long as the lower and upper approximation are far enough. When they're epsilon far away, then you have your approximation. How to achieve that the red one actually converges to the black one? So uh, to sum up what you have seen uh, seen in, uh, in, on the pictures, what we have to consider is for each of the end components that is there, we need to consider the regions in which uh, the situation or the behavior of minimizer is different. So look at the different areas of directions that behave the same. And then for each of those uh, components and for each of the regions, you have to find the simple end components. And once you find the sex, uh, which, uh, well, sorry for the name, uh, it's what we, we already tried to find a, a better abbreviation, but uh, this one just sticked. Um, anyway, so once you sort out all the simple end components, uh, by deflating their value to what they can really get. So getting rid of the circular dependency as we know it from uh, the simpler cases. Then uh, this gives you the decomposition into, uh, into parts that you can then easily stitch together. And uh, so you actually have to keep track of, uh, of, these, uh, of all these parts uh, in, in your approximation process. And uh, then uh, let me conclude uh, what we have just seen is uh, the first result on approximability of the problem at all. So that means for the generalized reachability stochastic games. Uh, fortunately, it also is a so-called anytime algorithm in the sense that uh, you can stop that algorithm at any point of time and ask for the current error bound and it gives you the current approximation and the, and the current error bound. So it, it, it can keep on outputting uh, all the time, um, uh, all the time the results. Now, of course, uh, the decidability remains open. Uh, even the question of the finite description of the frontier is open. Is, is it actually a finite, uh, or I mean a finite uh, collection of, uh, of uh, line segments, uh, or at least can it be described in a, in a reasonably finite way? And the question of the upper value where we switch the uh, soup and inf, uh, that's, uh, that's also another question. And of course, generalization of the problem to uh, more complex uh, settings. So we're working on concurrent games, uh, also on the expected uh, total reward. And of course, one might want to also make it a bit more practical uh, in the sense that uh, here we are updating all the states, we are chopping uh, the area of regions into small pieces, and we don't really worry too much about what makes sense, what is computationally uh, expensive, but doesn't really help us that much in the approximation process. And some sort of learning-based algorithm might, uh, might be, of course, very helpful to, to obtain something that is uh, practically implementable and, and relevant. And with that, I thank you for uh, your attention and I'm ready to take further questions to this talk uh, before I then uh, let you know a bit about the, the new tool. Thanks, Jan, for this nice, very nice talk. So yeah, I mean, it's time maybe for five, 10 minutes of question uh, before the, yeah, so there is a question by Martin, so please, Martin. Yeah, hi, Jan. Thanks for hi. a very nice talk. I have a question um, related to the um, variant of um, generalized switchability games without um, probabilities. So there's this nice paper by Nasana L and Florian Horn about um, generalized switchability games. And they um, leave a nice open problem, also sort of a napkin problem. What happens if you 
restrict the size of the target sets. So they show that if you allow three elements in each target set, then the problem is um, t-space hard. And there's also a t-space upper bound. If you have um, singleton target sets, it's um, in p-time and it's open what the complexity is um, if you have only a sets of size two as targets. Do you have looked into this problem and how it um, changes the complexity for your problem? No, we haven't. Uh, that's of course an interesting suggestion. However, my gut feeling is that um, the complex, or no, not the complexity, but the, 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 the difficulties that are arising here with respect to not being able to even see uh, what is the shape of the curve and all that, is then um, the, sir, uh, is then the, the quantitative cycles that don't allow you to get the answers directly. And then you have to, make this sort of fixed point computation. It's not a simple one uh, because then uh, it's the, the, the so-called simple components then dynamically change. So then uh, I think that is the source of the difficulty here. Uh, so that I can imagine that even even restricting the, the target sets uh, in, I mean, I mean in using very restrictive, uh, very restrictive uh, conditions, would not necessarily help in overcoming these issues. So I guess we have to first somehow figure out uh, how even very simple interactions of um, say two different uh, two different values uh, coming from um, two different directions, uh, how they interact in these in these fixed point uh, computations. But this is already unclear for a very restricted setting. So I'm not sure whether we could uh, utilize that. I guess once we understand uh, the quantitative part, it might well be that uh, some of the restrictions from the non-stochastic case help us uh, also in, in, in the stochastic case. It's an interesting, interesting suggestion, of course. Okay, thanks. Other questions? What we might as well do is, I may also uh, tell you about what matter and meanwhile, maybe uh, yeah. uh, people formulate their questions and we can have uh, another uh, question, a question session right after that. Sure. So let me then just uh, quickly change uh, my screen. And actually, um, very sorry to uh, all of you who have Attended highlights because this is going to be almost the same uh, five minute uh, announcement as uh, some of you may have seen there. So sorry to those of you who have, um, who have seen it uh, a few days ago. However, my feeling is that uh, this could be so useful to uh, many of you that I couldn't resist but to uh, tell you about this. And uh, the reason why it could be useful is that many of us are actually uh, responsible for teaching an introductory automata course. In my experience, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to see the bright young minds getting for the first time uh, diving into theoretical computer science and really appreciating that. And then uh, we also see in the exams how much they have learned. On the other hand, uh, the effort that goes into the corrections of the exams and corrections of the homeworks is just insane. And for that, you don't even have to have a course of 1,000 people like we have here in Munich. Uh, but it's just uh, it's just too much. Fortunately, exactly for that reason, there has been Automata Tutor that uh, serves for uh, automatic grading and uh, practicing uh, simple constructions on uh, non-deterministic and deterministic finite automata. And uh, since uh, its inception has been used by dozens of uh, universities and thousands of students, and uh, yeah, so there was Automata Tutor and uh, Luca Cito saw that it was good. Uh, let me just quickly cite uh, what he says about it. And um, he says, this is how the construction of finite automata that recognize regular languages should be taught in a modern way. I wish I had similar tools for all the topics I need to cover in that course. 
and we felt the same need. So we uh, extended uh, the work of, of Loris D'Antoni um, uh, and uh, we can present you now the Automata Drawer version three. So the wish is now granted. It comes not only with uh, support for DFAs and NFAs, but uh, automatic grading and feedback for all the other standard chapters that are in the, core, uh, in the course, together with support for automatic program uh, generation. And uh, the obvious question is, of course, how can you profit from that in your course? And to show you that it's really easy, uh, I will show you uh, a very quick live demo of the, to the whole process. So once you are locked in uh, with the teacher credentials that we give you, then you can create a course. So let me see if I stayed locked in. Uh, yes, you can of course view the course. You can start constructing, uh, so you can start producing exercises. So here, for instance, on construction of pushdown automata. So here you're supposed to specify the sample solution. So say we accept with empty stack. Uh, we have here the on the canvas, we can draw the, the sample automaton for, for the solution. So you can click uh, and create a state very simply. Uh, you can draw edges uh, in a pretty intuitive way. Uh, so in push down, you read a letter, you read uh, from the stack and you put something on the stack, right? Uh, so you can of course, uh, drag more edges, you see they get nicely aligned. Uh, oops. Uh, so, let, so that it makes sense, let me just uh, keep this like that. And then to make it a bit more interesting, of course, we want to uh, pop from the stack. So that's just this. All right, so uh, once you specify your solution, you can, uh, of course, uh, give it a name, uh, so my example, and you're specified to the students, uh, sorry, I'm using some funny keyboard, uh, that um, uh, tells you uh, or tells the students what to actually, uh, uh, Sorry, it's funny. Uh, what to actually look for. Uh, yeah. And uh, in this case, uh, it's, it's of course this one. Yeah. And now- yeah, uh, There's a small bug in your, what you drew on the canvas. You want to have B and uh, when you pop the Z. Oops, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So uh, you have just heard Maxi who is uh, one of the main uh, developing guys of, uh, of the tool. Uh, so thank you. And uh, we can create the exercise. And uh, okay, there was an exercise, but was it any good? Uh, so we have to check whether uh, well, students, students will have hard enough time to getting any points, right? So uh, then uh, we can pretend for a moment that we are students. So how uh, there was some uh, Z's, uh, there was some uh, Z's that we had to put on the stack, right? Uh, and then some more, what was that? Something like this maybe. And uh, let me just try that. Oops, I created some more states. Okay, who cares? Submit. And uh, Automata Jutra takes some uh, time. And finally answers okay, we don't get any points. Uh, the reason is that uh, it's a subset. It, you give, uh, you're given a country example, you also uh, don't need to use that many states. Okay, so the teacher wants some B, so let's give him some B. So uh, a B over here. So a flash of genius, let's put this, but the more Bs the better, right? So let's put some more Bs. Um, All right, so, okay, now it's seven points, right? So uh, the student again sees, uh, sees the problem. And so once we're ready uh, in seeing that uh, this is good enough torture, we can just uh, publish this. Uh, that means setting up the deadline, the number of uh, attempts that are allowed. And once you pose the problem, then uh, you can collect the grades after the deadline and, um, off you go. So since uh, uh, it has been introduced and uh, uh, in this semester it has been used already at several universities, at TUM it has been uh, evaluated as the most favorite uh, way of learning 
so uh, that uh, is actually uh, pretty good for us because uh, on the one hand we give uh, better service to students than ever and at the same time uh, we are reducing our load from uh, loaded uh, about to a half of the person hours because about 25,000 homeworks have been corrected automatically in this course and about 75,000 uh, um, advice or feedback personalized feedback has been given to the students throughout that single course without any tutor having to do uh, having to do anything so with that, I uh, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to seeing you at automatatutor.com. And thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to tell you about this. Uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, it looks, looks uh, amazing. So any question maybe on the last topic or the previous one? Mm. So, uh, so on this topic, can I ask a very very? Yeah. It's a, it's maybe a bit strange question, but since you mentioned the mean payoff uh, during the talk, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, connected to a paper by Jean Francois. I'm sorry, uh, I want to show. Okay, so how strong is the connection? Can it be rewritten in some way? I do not know the related paper uh, on it. Can you rewrite it in somehow as a mean payoff game, or 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 what is the no mean mean payoff games. I mean that is that is uh, somehow uh, maybe uh, interesting to 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 uh, or um, surprising to to observe. They are simpler than um, or they are simpler than the uh, the reachability generalized reachability games. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason being. Uh, or, or the intuition behind this is that uh, uh, the mean payoff is a bit more uh, regular in the sense that, I mean, if you look at, for instance, if you look at uh, if you look at uh, MDPs, then uh, there you can describe everything with uh, with um, Linear programs in the same way as you can do that uh, with uh, with reachability, uh, but here in uh, in the in the stochastic games, uh, it's uh, have entered. I mean, you can't uh, you can't change things to absorbing. You can't use the this, this standard trick, and uh, the fact that you have been already in targets at t one uh, prevents you from getting anything more if you go there for the second time. But in the mean payoff, you can kind of track how frequently or how often you are here or there, which can be done. Whereas in the in the reachability case, uh, it's more discrete, or it's it, you have to remember whether you have been in targets T one or not. And going there again uh, doesn't help you, and that sort of destroys the simplicity or sort of uh, kind of uh, regular shape of the thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that that is some of the intuition. But so so in the one dimensional case, we know that we can reduce mean payoff games to simple stochastic games. But this is, I mean, and and so, but is it the case for the multi-dimensional case? I mean, because the, those reductions they work basically because of the the memoryless. Uh, property uh, of yeah i I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, well I, I maybe formulated that wrong i said they, they are simpler conceptually. i'm not sure that they are conceptually simpler i'm not sure that there is a known reduction at the moment mm -hmm. uh, and uh, i do believe that uh, i do believe that uh, the noise reachability games would have uh, complexity that is worse than that of um, mean generalized mean pay of games uh, but I don't think that uh, that uh, any formal claim is already published in that direction but I think this is the conjecture of, of uh, everyone who is who is working on this okay thank you thanks for the question so the for automata tutor, uh, so there is a subscription to to take or. So basically, if you load, let me just uh, have a look here. 
So if you log out, uh, then I mean, this is if you type automatatutor.com, then you're redirected to our Munich web page, where you can either just try it out to see what it does, or uh, you can log in uh, if you already have uh, your login, or you can register and here you can ask uh, for uh, teacher access rights, uh, and that will be reviewed by us uh, manually so that we actually have to see whether the person is indeed a, a teacher of computer science. Mm -hmm. And then we give the credentials and then you have the right to, uh, to organize a course and everything. Uh, all the other students simply register to a course I, uh, given by the, I mean, they're given by the teacher an ID and they pick the, pick the course to which they register with that ID. And um, they have, uh, they put their, uh, uh, for instance, their official uh, email address of the university. And this way you can, uh, you can verify that it's them uh, who is mm -hmm. accessing this. Nice. Okay, good. Any other question or remarks? Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so what technology is used to, to mark uh, and, and actually to grade uh, the solutions? I mean, how do you compare and how, how do you rate it? So uh, it's not uh, particularly smart. So, I mean, you might be hoping for some a very intelligent learning procedure that tries to discover frequent bugs and tries to see like uh, how many steps are needed uh, typically to change your decision, your, your uh, solution to a correct one. Actually, nothing like that. We are uh, more or less brute forcing the short words and uh, some longer ones to see uh, whether your solution is correct. Actually, for the, for the example that I've shown you, right, we need to determine the equivalence of the PDAs. And equivalence of non-deterministic PDAs is, is not decidable. So what we're doing is, of course, we're not really deciding it. We are approximating it by uh, quite a number of, of short words, so to some, uh, I mean, exhaustively to some length. And then uh, if actually you know that it uh, coincides on all the short words and maybe on some longer ones, then, I mean, uh, unless you have, unless you're really, really smart, then you probably couldn't have uh, faked the solution or you have introduced used so many states that you could uh, easily detect that syntactically. So uh, we use the same thing for actually grading. So uh, if, uh, for instance, it, it, it has this, this advantage that, for instance, if I miss the B transition that I had there, uh, so if I only put the A transitions and I'm missing the B transition completely, I get zero points because I don't really have any, any word uh, except them. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, uh, accepting a completely different language. And of course, that is not maybe optimal because uh, of course the, the student may be stupid not to put any B if the language should contain Bs, right? Uh, on the other hand, it's only one, uh, one arrow that is missing, right? And then you might debate, uh, is this a good, uh, good enough grade or, or is, is it too strict? And that's why we mostly use it actually for homeworks and for practice. And uh, with uh, exams, uh, one might be a bit more cautious uh, whether the grading is actually what you really want. Of course, you can detect whether it's correct or incorrect, but then how much incorrect then if, if the real grade then depends on it, uh, you may want to check a couple of solutions before you actually try it or, or maybe not, not necessarily rely on that uh, in the final exam. Okay. And have you compared the, the grading that's done by the tool with what's been done by hand, maybe in sort of previous semesters? Well, as I said, it it does differ. I mean, we didn't really have like a, a large study on this, but I mean, just from the from the feeling or from from the experience, of course, it does differ. Like I said, uh, uh, with, if if you're missing out of these three transitions, if uh, one of them is missing, then maybe out of ten points, you would still give some points, right? I mean, there I know teachers who wouldn't give any points, right? I mean, it also yeah. becomes quite subjective, right? But I mean, still maybe uh, it's somehow similar, so you would give some points, whereas the tool in this particular case doesn't give any. Whereas if you have one extra transition that just uh, leads to a few more words that are accepted, then we gave seven out of ten points. Is it then adequate that there is, uh, well, I mean, it's, 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 
often it's not completely uh, completely off uh, but um, it, it can be that uh, it's it's not very good that's why also it's uh, is mostly used with uh, more attempts allowed so the student is mm -hmm. allowed to submit gets the feedback and then rethinks and knows, okay, I have to do something about the bees. So it doesn't happen that you make a stupid mistake and you don't notice because you, you, get, uh, you, get, uh, you get notification on this. And then uh, depending on the number of attempts, uh, you converge uh, or don't converge to a correct solution. Uh, actually, it's always good to give a limit because uh, if there is no limit, then people don't think. But as soon as you give even a limit of like 50, they start thinking. I mean, that's an interesting psychological effect that, uh, that we have observed that uh, the, the, solutions are, the solutions are better if, um, uh, if, if there is the limit. Mm. Okay, last question. So does it help uh, to reduce complaints from students? Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, in the sense that uh, the previously, of course, there were complaints of the students for each single homework. Mm -hmm. uh, now there are complaints about uh, why is this solution only graded uh, that many points? Uh, I mean, well, uh, it's, it's automatic, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's the way that it is. It's definitely fair. So it's the same for everyone. So people no more claim that one homework has been corrected differently than that of their peers, which is usually the hugest problem uh, by far. Uh, of course, they, uh, they do uh, ask about uh, things, uh, I mean, how to operate this tool, uh, although, I mean, there is a help box everywhere. Uh, they do ask uh, how to fix uh, this and that, and they think maybe the tool is broken because they don't give the, they don't get the full points, although they think that it's correct, and so on. Um, but uh, it significantly reduces the load on the regular tutors. Uh, however, of course, it increases our load on, uh, the single person, typically it's just a single person who is responsible for communicating uh, to students uh, with respect to the tool. And that has to be a, a bit more qualified person. So the person needs to know uh, a bit what is happening under the hood. Uh, it cannot be just a student who had the course last time, but has no idea what the tool is doing. Uh, so uh, there is a bit more demand on the qualified work, but I mean, it's just, just single person. And then a lot less demand on uh, sort of, uh, monkey style corrections anyway very good yeah thank you <laughs> welcome thanks thanks a lot so i think that now it's maybe time to move to the uh, last session about accepted papers and um so, okay, Martin, so thank you very much again yeah thanks a lot uh, jan and uh, yeah so um so they they